when someone is doing the next deck and people ask about what your exit strategy that's Dare Okuju, the founder and CEO of MFS Africa. They can say, well, we can sell to Paga or we can sell to Paystar. In the long run, I think it will actually be much better for us. I recently had the opportunity to speak with Dare, as well as several others who you'll be introduced to shortly. On the recent acquisition of Bionic by MFS Africa, we believe that this kind of acquisition in particular is an important one for the ecosystem and therefore an important story to tell of fintech consolidation one African fintech acquiring another African fintech. When I travel around, especially one African country to the other, you see a lot of companies doing interesting things. And you see a lot of them struggling with some of the, the same problems. That's Luke Jahare, the founder of Bionic. It's almost very clear what the potential partnerships and mergers and acquisitions could be. And I think if we can have more and more of those conversations happening between these companies, it's just almost a no-brainer in a lot of cases. I hope we'll see more companies thinking about Stronger Together. Last episode, Season 2, Episode 4, we talked to investors about valuations and the pathways to exit. In this episode, we take an inside and in-depth look at the MFS Africa acquisition of Bionic. How and why did the deal come together? What were the most important points of consideration for an acquisition of this kind? What was the selling process like to each company's stakeholders? Post-deal, what does integration look like and what growth opportunities will exist for the combined company? And finally, what could this deal mean for the African ecosystem in terms of broadening the scope of prospective exit paths for African startups? Last episode, we went on a hypothetical startup journey from idea to exit. This episode, let's go on a real one. You're listening to The Flip, the podcast exploring more contextually relevant stories from entrepreneurs around Africa. Welcome back to The Flip. I'm your host, Justin Norman. On June 30th of this year, MFS Africa announced their acquisition of Bionic, a growth stage startup offering enterprise digital payment services to SMEs in seven markets across Africa. To get the inside story and discuss the implications of this acquisition, I talked to four entrepreneurs who have all played an integral role in not only scaling their respective businesses, but also in making this acquisition happen. Two of these entrepreneurs, the founders, you've already been introduced to. I'm Dario Kuju. I'm the founder and CEO of MFS Africa. I'm Luke Chahari, and I'm the founder of Bionic. The other two individuals we'll hear from both joined a bit later on in the journey. I'm Karina Rumberger. I am the CEO of Bionic. I'm Rachel Balsham. I am the Deputy CEO and Head of Corporate Development at MFS Africa. But before we reintroduce Karina and Rachel to the story, let's start at the very beginning with Dare and Luke founding their respective companies. Dare started MFS Africa in 2009 after leaving MTN, where he was responsible for rolling out mobile money across various MTN markets on the continent. Dare saw parallels between mobile money and the rise of dot-com businesses back in the late 90s, and felt there was a need and an opportunity to create critical infrastructure that could have a similar impact on mobile money as the transistor had on computers and the internet. I was looking for the transistor in mobile money. And for me, it boils down to really four things. It boils down to the KYC information. Then there was the authentication tool that the PIN represents. And then ability to credit, which was kind of given already. And then ability to debit, which was not that present back then in mobile money. And I thought, if you combine those four things, actually, you can recreate any financial service. So if we build a platform that can connect to a mobile money platform and do those four things, we will be in the game for a long time because we will just be playing at the transistor level. When that became clear to me, that's when I said, OK, let's build a company. And back in those early days, there was a lot to build and a lot of mobile network operators to connect to and make interoperable which was reflected in how MFS Africa went after and explored their initial opportunities. So 2010 to 2014, we had to go tactical. We package it as a value-added service provider. So when we connect, so we will tell mobile networks that, look, you know, we can bring all these services. Do you want to do loan? We can combine these four things to make loan. Do you want to do insurance? Of course, we can combine this. So let us be those people who package and bring value-added services to you. And you worry about your distribution network and your cash-in, cash-out agents and your Fondamo platform that is crashing. And while MFS Africa was able to provide various services to mobile network operators, 
their initial approach just wasn't sustainable. Little did I know that that was slowly killing us as well, because we were not that a big team. We were just spreading way too thin, right? And none of these things was really at scale. But what it, each of them gave us was a bit more network. So we were connecting more to people. But by beginning of 2014, we were dying of slow death at that time because we couldn't raise money. And part of the reason they couldn't raise money was because of their story and just the sheer amount of things that they were doing at that time. But as the mobile money environment matured in those early years, MFS Africa was able to focus their efforts and turn a corner. Money transfer was always a little bit the holy grail, but a lot of people were thinking about it from north to south. So from Europe into Africa, from the US into Africa. And toward the end of 2014, something changed in the ecosystem, which is the recognition of something that we've been preaching for a long time, that the Africa to Africa money transfer opportunity is bigger than the other one, through mobile money at least, because there was less explanation to be done, consumer behavior to change, you know, trying to convince someone on a high street in London to send money to a phone. You need to take a chair and sit down and explain. While if you want to convince someone from Kenya to send money to Uganda, it's a no-brainer. They've been doing it for years at that point. So phase two was really kind of zeroing on that from 2015. It was around that time that Rachel, MFS Africa's deputy CEO, joined the journey. The kind of semi-pivot that we did in that, that early period was to go from the experimentation to an API-based B2B hub. The mechanics weren't very different. So debiting somebody in Cote d'Ivoire for their insurance premium and crediting somebody in Benin for their microloan you know, it's the same function, but we can recombine them and call it a remittance when those two people know each other and do it on purpose. So in my, in my first couple of years, we really honed in on what are the things that we can scale and what are the things that we have control over. Remittances were something that users were instantly familiar with. They're already sending money. And for MFS Africa, it became about facilitating and enabling for those looking to make transactions across borders or between mobile network operators. Our ambitions when I joined were to be, again, this multifunctional, all-powerful <laughs> um, platform that can connect any store of value to any other store of value or also any type of function. And that any-to-any -any interoperability has really been like our guiding, kind of our, our lodestar in terms of where we direct the strategy of the business. Now, before we go any further with Dare, let's go back to the beginning of Bionic. Here's Luke. Around that time, mobile payments were coming of age. So Safaricom was doing well in Kenya. I was in Uganda at the time, and I was working with Grameen Foundation, helping them build out mobile-based tools for agriculture. And we were trying to connect to mobile payments, and it was not easy. These platforms were focused on P2P payments, you know, being able to transfer money from one person to another. And they're doing great in that space. But if you were a business that was trying to connect to these platforms, you had to jump through a number of hoops and you had to talk to more than one mobile payment provider. You had to spend a lot of time up front trying to get the connections in place. Seeing and intimately understanding these pain points, Luke knew there was a business around solving these problems for SMEs. It made sense that someone would play this aggregator role, just like, you know, with, with the SMS space, there were middlemen who provided the bridge between the business world and more than one of these telcos. As the Bionic team set out on this journey, they participated in and received funding from Techstars in Cape Town, and then set out on a fundraise. We would have raised around the end of 2016, just coming out of Techstars, early 2017, we were raising a larger round, but one of the partners or vehicle that they were going to be using to fund us fell through. And it was a bit of a blow because they were the lead on this fundraising round. And that kind of meant that some of the other potential funders decided not to proceed. And it was weird because we found ourselves at a crossroads where we could go out and try to spend a lot more time raising again. But we were fairly liquid as well. We didn't we we were not we we're not hurting all so we said why didn't we put all our energy into pushing for profitability? So Bionic got profitable. And kind of set us up for the period that eventually led to us being profitable around 2018. In total, we've raised under a million for sure, somewhere between the 750 and a million. And in the time since hitting profitability, Bionic's growth continued substantially. 
to the point where they found themselves under-resourced. Enter Karina, who took over from Luke as CEO. I officially joined the team in August of 2018. And my job was really to kind of help, or is, was, is, we are on the journey of, transitioning from a small, scrappy, lean startup where you just do whatever you need to do to keep those doors open for another week or another month, to a scalable business that could have systems and start to grow its brand and its presence in the space. And through the process of growing and scaling, it was clear that in spite of their profitability, they needed to go out and fundraise to support their growth. At the same time that they hit profitability, they also started to see massive volume scale. And it quickly threatened to overwhelm a very small, dedicated global team. And so they looked at that and they just said, listen, we've got to capacitate this growth or it will crush us. So capital raise was pretty obvious next step. Now back to MFS Africa who grew and scaled significantly as well to capture the cross-border money transfer opportunity within Africa. So their next phase of growth was around a few specific initiatives. One was we have to go deeper and broader in Africa. And that meant connect everything. Like we will connect in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Seychelles, in Swaziland. We are no longer looking for just the big countries, the big networks. We just want the whole continent wired up, right? The second one was to connect that thing to the world. So we realized that a lot of the people we were connecting had broader aspirations than just money transfer, that there was a change in in demographics and changing in what the consumer wanted. And as MFS Africa was fundraising in 2018 for their Series B and to support this next growth phase, something happened. We went in to raise 10. We ended up raising 23. Which enabled MFS Africa to pursue a bonus strategy, in particular around the SME customer segment. Their interest in pursuing an opportunity for SMEs was to some degree demand-led. Here's Rachel. We were seeing a lot of users sending, you know, every week or every week to two or three people and repeatedly, same, same, you know, small set of users. And what that indicated to us was that this looks like small trade. This looks like, you know, small business activity. So we thought, okay, actually there's a market here that's really not being served very well, which is the kind of just at the top of power user and just at the bottom of SME. And that market is not being served by business banking, but they have outgrown the consumer suite of tools. So this idea of the SME, the micro SME segment sort of stuck in our minds for for a few years now around how do we help them scale? Those are the things that were in our minds as we were looking at opportunities to take the business further, whether it was going to be through acquisition or through new product development. And Dari set out to put some of that money they fundraised to good use. It actually started around our view of trying to get into the SME piece where we thought there was no even the beginning of how we get to do that. We, you know, we're so far from that market. Then we say, okay, why, why don't we set up something which can allow us to do some partnership with people playing in these things with a bit of capital to the extent that our hub will be useful. So if we can put our hub to use, and people who will start with hindsight, who will be able to build things faster, quick, you know, better. Why don't we support some of that? So the company launched the MFS Africa Frontiers Fund to make minority investments and provide strategic insight and value to others in the payment space. And in particular, those who could plug into the MFS Africa hub through a commercial partnership, and also those who are serving a different customer segment than they were. So that's why we have MFS Africa Frontiers, which was to invest you know, make minority relatively small, fifty to five hundred thousand dollars for minority stake in companies that we can partner with on a commercial side. Perhaps it's a bit unusual for a Series B startup to have a fund to make investments itself. And Dari agrees. And you know, it was a little bit unusual. I mean, a lot of people, including some of our shareholders, thought that was that was not a good thing to do. But this market, there's no playbook really. We don't know how it's going to work out, how it's going to play out. So why not try some things that are also unusual? But for MFS Africa in particular, their desire to pursue this strategy in the first place required them to admit that there were certain things, like serving SMEs, that just weren't in their DNA, especially at this stage of the company's journey. About halfway through, I'd say by June 2019, 
So six months after we set that strategy, it was clear to me that we did not have it in our DNA to build this from scratch, to be able to build an offering for, for the SME market. So here MFS Africa was, with a bit of money to invest and with an active interest in exploring opportunities in the SME sector. And at the same time, Bionic, a fintech building tools for SMEs, was actively fundraising. So the two founders got together. I started kind of going back a little bit of who I know, who's doing this, and then reconnected with Bionic. Then I reached out to Luke to say, hey, you know, what's up? What are you up to? And it turns out they were raising money. And then indeed, at the beginning, we were like, hey, maybe we can do, you know, for our frontiers investment. And Luke was in Washington, D.C. at that time. When I got an email from Derry saying, hey, I'm going to be in New York. Let's meet up. So I, I, I got the train to New York and had lunch with Derry. And we started talking fundraise. So they started talking fundraise and things progressed pretty rapidly. I think the relationship grew really quickly. It became a really close relationship over the next three to four months. And all that time, it was first fundraise, and then it became, could we be one of the larger people in the round? And as we went towards term sheet, when it became clear that they were looking to be, to take on the whole round, the question became, all right, so what happens afterwards? And so we you know, started talking about what a majority investment might look like. The discussion kind of snowballed into, okay, what would happen if uh, if we talked about the whole thing? And then we said, well, that's a very different story because we had this trajectory we're on and we started talking about what that would look like. Pretty quickly, him and I got to the same conclusion that, you know, there is an opportunity here to initially, you know, do a majority deal. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought they just do the whole thing. You know, what will it take to do the whole thing? And by December, we were on the same page. So why did a full acquisition of Bionic make sense for both parties? Well, for many reasons, starting with the synergies from a product perspective. Here's Karina. Often, MFS Africa would come up in the context of commercial conversations around like, oh, so how are you different from MFS Africa? And we would say, well, you know, they do international remittance and we don't. We do domestic collections and a payments management toolbox for SMEs and institutions. They facilitate money transfer via mobile money. So, you know, where they stop, we start and vice versa. And here's Rachel again. What's cool is that we've been focusing on very different segments of the market. And so there isn't a lot of duplication. There isn't a lot of you know, turf war. There's a very clear delineation between you know, where, we've, where we've each been focusing. And then there were many strategic and integration-related considerations on the MFS Africa side with Dare and Rachel. The idea of the full buyout actually was easier to sell because I think everybody also saw that there would be a clean deal. There was a bit of worry about being half pregnant. If you make a majority investment that's less than a full acquisition and it's a strategic investment and you're trying to, you know, go the distance together, you open the door to the risk of not being able to realize all the synergies that you want to. There may still be this idea like, okay, well, we have them for this investment, but we're we're also going to go do our own thing for this thing. And we wanted that commitment to, okay, we're going this journey together. We'll be one company with multiple products. But none of this would be possible without an alignment of mission and vision of both companies and its leadership. The culture has to be there that we can actually integrate with this team, that we're not going to fight, we see the world the same way. And it was something that Dare had to sell to the Bionic team. I very quickly hopped on a plane and went down to Joburg in November and met Dare for breakfast. And in my mind, I didn't tell Dare this, but in my mind, I was saying, you have one hour to convince me why... I should trust my people with you. And he did. Uh, And what I was looking for was a shared kind of vision, a compatible approach to solving problems and to seeing the world and how we can make it a better place while not shortchanging the importance of return on investment. And he convinced me pretty quickly. So let's get into the weeds here a bit and talk tactics. What were the steps in the process to go from initial discussion to signed agreement? What did the selling process look like? Well, first it was to sell to the team first, because, I mean, and when I say sell, just to sound out, I mean, Rachel was involved in the initial conversation, then other members of the team. And that has been always something with us at MFS Africa. First of all, like, you know, we have 
a really, really a good team, talented people. They speak their mind and they tell it the way it is. So usually when I bring something like this, many times they send me back, right? Like say, hey, this is nonsense. It's going to be a distraction for us. For MFS Africa, the due diligence process was managed by multiple members of their exco. So the due diligence process was led by Maz Chapanda, who's our chief technical officer, and he's also a board member. And so he's also, I think, one of the more skeptical and most resistant to rose-colored glasses. So Maz led the process, and in so doing, he, you know, delegated the specific you know, the finance due diligence process was led by the CFO with Maz running the overall process and the operations due diligence run by the chief operating officer, et cetera. So there was a, a pretty widespread buy-in from the beginning of, you know, taking a look at the opportunity in the first place. We progressed in the due diligence really as a team. At the same time, Daray worked on selling into the MFS Africa board. Yeah, I have a pretty, a pretty working board, which I'm very grateful for. So can pick up the phone and have conversation about what's you know, this problem, this, this, how can you help? And I kind of did the same that with the, the different board members, just in a one-on-one first, just to say, hey, what do you think? It was, you know, if I have to score it, I would say the first reception was maybe a six out of 10, maybe 5.5. It was not a no, but it was not, yeah, let's go for it, right? So I had to spend a little bit of time. It was really to think about the things that they raised, you know, about culture again, about ability to feed. So going back and having, first of all, A, reflecting on that myself, but also have the conversation with Luke, have the conversation with the team. And eventually what that gave us was the list of key things that we needed to check in due diligence to say, we don't know these things for now, but indeed, if these things check out, it's a good deal. And as the opportunity to do a full acquisition took shape, the board's interest moved considerably. When I went back to my directors at that point, yeah, there was way more enthusiasm for that than for the initial idea that we had. Meanwhile, Luke was having similar conversations with Bionic's board and shareholders. So the first question is, is this really a serious thing or is it just feeling out, feeling out each other, especially when it brought it to the board level? And so we actually arranged some meetings where our board met with the MFS Africa team as well and had had a, a chat just to understand where everyone's going and especially when it was part of the, the discussion was are any of us staying on including some of the other shareholders and they wanted to know what they'd be buying into if they stayed on and what the MFS Africa trajectory was and and what the plan was beyond this fundraise for them. On the Bionic side while there were some shareholders who were interested in cashing out as they may have done anyway on a secondary market if Bionic had raised a minority round rather than go for a full acquisition, many shareholders bought into the vision such that they wanted to be a part of the combined company. Internally, we were talking, you know, people continuing on pro rata, you know, basically trying to maintain their shareholding. And so it was almost a discussion of whether or not they were putting more money in versus whether they were going to be taking money out. And in fact, some of them didn't take money out even with this opportunity. Some of them are still part of the combined company. What I can say is that investors got about a 5x return on their investment, which is great. They're all really happy. And the like folks who actually cashed out versus folks who rolled over into shares in the wider group was about 50-50. So about half of our shareholders cashed out and about half of them have rolled over, which is super exciting. While Luke was also handling many elements of the technical due diligence and product integration, Karina was managing what an acquisition meant for the Bionic team itself. I was really focused more on the sort of operational and people aspect of the deal, understanding what this would mean for management structures and hiring plans and where my team would fit with MFS Africa's team and where there were redundancies and where there were gaps. And then also how we would actually work together, how we would approach customers together. One of the most common questions I get is how many people are losing their jobs as a result of this? Are they just buying your tech stack and then, you know, kind of sending your people on their way? And from the very beginning, Dari and his team were clear that that was not what this was about, that they were buying control, but they were buying it in a way that was about collaboration and that the value that we brought to the table as Bionic 
it was our client sheet and it was our tech stack, but it was also a team that performed really, really well. And in order to grow quickly, MFS Africa recognized that they needed to add some capacity that was pretty high performing very rapidly. And one of the ways that you can do that is through an acquisition like this. So buy-in from the board and shareholders and from the teams. And all the while, the process went pretty quickly. So it went pretty quick, but it's because we've both been on the journey for a long time. There was a clear fit very early on. There was a clear understanding on what needed to be checked on each side to see if this is going to work. And the spirit was absolutely great from the beginning. First conversation was late October in New York. By December, we were discussing term sheet, and by Christmas, we had signed it. Then January, we just got going, and, and that's it. While at the time of this recording, the deal isn't officially closed, it is still subject to regulatory approval from the Fair Competition Commission in Tanzania. Let's discuss integration and implications for the combined company. From an integration standpoint, the primary objective is aligning the teams. My job as a CEO is also to just be disciplined and be very clear and be very honest to make sure that the people are not feeling threatened. But at the same time, we are being fair to everyone and making it really safe for not only Luke and Karina, but also the entire team that they actually belong to something and they are excited. Because if they're not excited, this is not, you know, we're not buying a factory, right? Where you can work, replace the workers and follow the procedures. It's a service business. So if people are not excited, it doesn't work. And I think I have paid a lot of attention and a lot of our integration and you know, how we approach the deal, but just to make sure that there is excitement. We don't turn off excitement on this side. Because if we do that, then we're not buying anything. We're making sure that relationships are built now so that cross-pollination and communication is easier in the future. We've started a, a bit of a buddy system where each member of the data team has an MFS Africa buddies. It's the work that MFS Africa has put into the people aspect of the integration that the new team believes will have positive implications. Understanding and helping convey to my team confidence that you know, they were actually what was being acquired, not just our tech stack, helping them to see the vision and feel secure that this was an opportunity and not an erasure. That's always a challenge when you, you blend two organizations or groups of people together, finding a new dynamic, a new footing, and making sure that as people's roles and responsibilities shift, the inevitable insecurity that comes with that gets acknowledged and respected and addressed in a meaningful way. And so I've spent a lot, a lot of time doing that. And from the get-go, we have weekly all-company calls on Wednesday afternoons. And then on the product and customer side, there are a lot of positive implications and opportunities there as well. You have a lot of IP on the tech side. And you've built this over time, so it's not just a simple system that you can merge with something else. And so we've spent a lot of time, both the tech and product teams on either side, trying to figure out what the quick wins are. And we've taken a customer-led approach where we know the, the things that customers are asking for, we know where we want to go, and we are, you know, working through the fastest and most agile way to get there. On the customer side of things, not a hard sell because, you know, MFS Africa experienced the converse of what we did with their clients, which is they would have to turn people away or refer them to us or our competitors when they would say, hey, we really want to be able to do domestic collections and disbursements in local currencies. They'd be like, oh, it's not really what we do. We're, you know, international transfers. And we would get the converse. You know, we'd have customers saying, okay, great. So we use you in Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda. Can we just pay our supplier in Rwanda from our Kenyan balance because that's where our, our HQ is? And we're like, well, no, that's not really what you do. You have to pre-fund your wallet in each local currency through our various, you know, money transfer banking partners. We don't do cross-border categorically, full stop. And they were always saying, okay, we understand, but man, it would be great if you did. And so in that regard, when we were finally able to tell customers, 
it was met with enthusiasm and relief. We can immediately see the benefits and the opportunities of the combined company. And this raises a question. Will we or should we start to see more fintech consolidation of this kind? To the question of why did Bionic choose to sell the entire business rather than raise a minority equity round, the benefit is clear in terms of the acquisition being a way to achieve the fundraising-related milestones. So if I had to look at the milestones, we said what we're going to do with the fundraising. I said we would double headcount close to 40. I mean, the combined company is, is over 80 people at this point, right? So check hit that box, right? Said countries would, would hit a certain number of countries. I mean, the combined company has access across over about 60 markets. So again, pretty good check mark there. So in terms of hitting the, the, the milestones that we said would hit, this was a super acceleration on that. The synergies and opportunity for the new MFS Africa has positive implications for the nature and requirements of venture investing. There are a few facts that one has to always keep in mind here. And one of them is that most markets in Africa are subscale. So success or winners will need to be multi-market. You will need to be multi-market to be able to get to a, something that is sizable and, and matters in the long run. How do you achieve that? Because most of this initiative or most businesses that we are seeing are still kind of starting in one particular market and then growing to multi-markets. And I think from that perspective, consolidation will play a big role. And the ability for fintech companies to think laterally about combining resources at some point to be able to achieve that scale faster. Dare expects to see more consolidation amongst venture-backed startups in the near future. If you just follow a little bit the money and look at, take the last five years in terms of VC investment into Africa, if you take another five to 10 years, those exits will be required. That will force, if people don't do it voluntarily, I think the capital will force those type of consolidation because either you are able to get to a scale that you can, you know, you can continue to run and work towards some sort of listing or be meaningful enough for outright acquisition, some sort of trade sales, or you will kind of disappear in this space. So because the founders will also need at some point to create a path toward exit, what we've done now with Bionic will slowly become a template, I think. will slowly become a way of thinking about how to get to an exit when if you're in fintech, uh, either a company or an investor at the moment in Africa. And I want to underscore that last point by Dare, that MFS Africa's acquisition of Bionic may become a template for the African tech ecosystem. Most people, when you think strategic acquisition, think about big, clunky corporate buying small, agile startup. Karina thought that may be Bionic's ultimate fate as well. So if I'm being completely honest with you, I don't think I saw this one coming. I didn't have this exit in mind as the future path, which is a great example of why it's important to be open to new possibilities because after seeing it start to take shape, I can't imagine a better path, to be completely honest with you. Neither did Luke. And so we had a slide of exits in FinTech in Africa, and it was Visa buying Fundamo and PayPal buying Zong. And so those were two up there. And then, so clearly in our minds, it was possible that one of the visas of this world, MasterCards of this world, might pursue an acquisition strategy at some point, especially to get in the mobile. But then, as we talk about strategic acquisition, that underscores the shared alignment and culture fit that MFS Africa and Bionic believe is a crucial element to this deal. Clearly, I think there's going to be consolidation. And I don't think there's a lack of acquirers. I think what if there's any lack, it's going to be around just alignment. The reason you mentioned some of these things not working out, where in a large, a large strategic buy is a smaller one, and well, five, six years later, they're just winding down the product. I think it's a lot about alignment. When companies combine, it's you know, different personalities, it's different company cultures, it's just different paths. And this is precisely why one African fintech acquiring another African fintech is so exciting and meaningful. What I find so exciting about the story of an African fintech startup exiting into another African fintech is the confidence that it shows in the market, both in terms of our ability 
to become a global player from an African stage. And our investors' confidence in the value of this market globally. I'm so happy that we didn't get swallowed up by a massive North American or Asian payments company, even though I thought that might be inevitable at one point, because this is a story about solutions being crafted in places and by people who have historically been passed over. The beauty of this deal is that we are being given, not just given permission, but encouraged or even commissioned to continue being focused on what it means to develop financial solutions and tech solutions in Africa for Africa, but also what that brings to the wider fintech conversation globally. As a template, perhaps this acquisition will broaden the perceived set of opportunities and exit pathways for other startups in the ecosystem. I think the consolidation that this acquisition represents and that the ecosystem is likely to see continue should inform other players. So if you're a if you're a large corporate and you're looking at the African tech ecosystem, you know, I think you should think about other African tech players as your competition for those acquisitions, not just other large corporates. So I think it's exciting for us that this we hope represents a change in terms of what is possible for other African startups, that a strategic exit that doesn't shift or pause or stop your company's growth and your company's services is possible. And we'll let Dare, the CEO of the new MFS Africa, have the last word. I think subconsciously, we are still trying too hard to please people outside of Africa and not hard enough to look at our own possibilities around here. And subconsciously, you know, obviously we all shout, hey, you know, there's not enough funding and so on. But we are still trying to run a playbook that is not ours too much. And one of the things that for me is different in our environment is that it's unlikely that the people who start the race are going to finish the race. And we have to just make sure that we pass this on and we build it enough that the next person can stand on shoulders of giant, but only the next person will see above the wall. And that should be okay with us as a success as well, not necessarily getting all the way to you know, ringing the bell on, on New York as New York's office chain. It should be absolutely saluted that someone like Dan and Luke has built a business that can be rolled into another business. And if tomorrow MFS Africa has to do that, I will be absolutely prepared to do it. If that's what it takes to actually create the prosperity while we start the whole thing in the first place. That's it for this week's episode of The Flip. A big thank you to Rachel for her help in organizing this episode and to Dare, Luke, and Karina for taking us inside the acquisition and for giving The Flip an opportunity to tell this story. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We also follow up each episode with a related essay on the topic, sent out each week in our Sunday newsletter. You can subscribe on our website, theflip.africa, or join the conversation on social media at The Flip Africa. Thanks as always for listening, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>